Hi everyone, this is Achyut Bhava from Nightlight Astrology and today I'm going to talk about the last quarter moon in Libra. Now this is a pretty significant last quarter moon specifically because it is winding down our eclipse season. We had a solar eclipse in the sign of Capricorn conjoined with Jupiter at the outset of the eclipse season which happened just after the Christmas holiday and then we recently had a full moon lunar eclipse in the sign of Cancer, uh, which was around January 10th, followed by the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn. So it's been a very eventful uh, eclipse season. And the last quarter moon of every moon cycle starts winding things down. Um, And so it's especially important to look at that last quarter moon cycle uh, within an, an eclipse season. It's always, uh, you know, it can slip under the radar, but it's always important. So that's what we're doing today. Let me go ahead and take, uh, give you a glimpse at the chart. Actually, before I do that, I forgot to mention tomorrow night, Thursday night, I begin the first of a three week series on the nodes of the moon in ancient astrology. Check out the events page on my website, nightlightastrology.com. If you want to register and join, it's not too late. It's a cool three week course. Uh, going to be talking about reincarnation, the soul, the nodes of the moon, and what ancient astrologers thought about those topics and drawing some comparisons and, and making some contrasts with what modern astrologers have to say about those topics today. So, okay. That's done. Public service announcement done. Now, um, here is the chart. You can see that the moon has just gone into uh, the sign of Libra. Not many people know this, but actually um, there was a zone of degrees that basically went from about 15 Libra to about 15 Scorpio, sometimes called the, the burnt path, the burnt road, I've heard it called the Via Combusta. The Via Combusta happens from about 15 Libra to 15 Scorpio. It is the two signs, Scorpio and Libra, that the lights are depressed in. So the moon is in its fall in Scorpio and the sun in Libra. And in horary astrology, when planets traveled through these degrees, these are the autumnal signs, the signs that have to do with the sun's uh, descent toward the south. Uh, in in the language of astrology. And so when the lights are descending toward the south, the the light is uh, growing, it's growing darker, basically in the solar year, and there's descent involved. And so a tough place for the lights. It's important to mention this because this last quarter moon is taking place within that zone. And that zone has for hundreds of years in astrology been, um, you know, it's a little bit of a taboo zone of the zodiac, especially for the moon to travel through. When the moon travels through that burnt path, there is just sometimes a sense that um, it's a little things are a little heavier. Um, par for the course with Saturn and Pluto conjoining, right? Not like a huge surprise, but I wanted to add that in there because this is also a last quarter moon that's coming at the end of eclipse season. And here's what we're going to see: move forward about a day from now, and you're going to see the moon slowly coming into um, the. Uh, last quarter square. Go forward one more day. Back up just a bit here. There we go. You can see it ex- exactly occurring uh, on Friday of this week. You can see here is the moon at about 26 Libra and the sun at 26 Capricorn. And that's Friday morning here in the East Coast, United States. And you can see that as the moon is passing through that, it's going to hit squares to Saturn. It's going to hit a square to Pluto. So, you know, the moon is making a a trifecta of squares all at once. And that's a big deal. Um, It's a big deal because what we're doing is we're bringing the energy of this this eclipse season to a close. Now, you know, what do last uh, last quarter moons generally mean? I'm going to read you something today thought I had it out, but I put it back in my shelf earlier. Okay, so there's a great book that I want to recommend to you called Astrology and the Authentic Self by Demetra George. She is, I consider her one of my teachers. She's been a great mentor and helped me over the years um, and a real source of encouragement and inspiration. And uh, one of her students, uh, Alex Garrett, recently came and did a talk on the lunar series, the lunar lunation um, cycle, excuse me. And uh, it was a great talk. And she's been a longtime 
longtime apprentice of Dimitra's. At any rate, um, so what I want to bring to your attention now is what she writes about the last quarter moon phase, because I think it's really good. So here's what she says. Now the crop has been harvested and whatever fruit is left on the vine begins to decompose, drawing its energy inward to create the seed for the next cycle. She's talking, of course, about the lunation cycle as it's re often related analogously to the life cycle of a plant or plants in a garden or crops. People born during the last quarter moon phase, now she's talking about in birth charts, but this is applicable for us now too. Likewise, periodically find themselves faced with the necessity of letting go of obsolete forms that have fulfilled their purpose and severing themselves from the parent plant. Dane Rudyar, who's a famous modern astrologer, we'll be talking about him a little bit in our Nodes of the Moon series coming up, called this phase a crisis in consciousness because the crises that occur are not the physical crises of the outer world, but rather crises of thought in the inner mental realms. When these individuals realize that they no longer believe in the ideas they used to hold because now they know better, it is excruciatingly difficult to continue being the people they used to be since they no longer hold the values of their former selves. They turn away from old accomplishments and begin to look for new ideas around which to reorganize their thinking. It's often difficult for them to externalize the change until they have first worked it through in their own minds. During this transition, they often continue to work to act in accordance with the old image, even though it is no longer a genuine reflection of their current authentic selves. So why do I like that so much? Well, it's eclipse season and eclipse seasons bring really big changes. You could think of the moon cycle in general like tides. And when the new moon comes in every month, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a peak moment in the, in the tidal cycle, as are, as are the full moons. Um, low tide, high tide, I couldn't tell you which is which. But they, they bring energy in and out in sets, and they get amplified around new moon, first quarter, full moon, and last quarter. When we're in eclipse season, it's like the waves on all parts of all of the cardinal points of the lunar cycle, new moon, first quarter, full moon, last quarter, are really big. What does that mean? It means more intense energy. Sometimes people can feel that in their bodies or in their minds, or sometimes it means more intense karmically or, or karmic or faded events in your life around you that are coming through during eclipse season, or the seeds of deep changes that will come in time because eclipses often take a while to play out are planted during these cycles. Uh, so when it comes to the last quarter moon of an eclipse cycle that's been as intense as this one has been, and this is, these are also the last eclipses while the nodes of the moon are still in the signs of Cancer and Capricorn. We'll get some eclipses in Cancer and Capricorn, but the nodes of the moon will have changed signs. And that's coming, uh, let me just make sure I've got that right. I'm, I'm 99% sure about that. Let me just, yeah. So the nodes of the moon will change signs. Uh, let's see, we've got, <clears throat> you'll get some, in the very beginning of June is when we'll have our first eclipse in um, Sagittarius and Gemini. So yeah, they are, they are, this is, so these are the, we, we will have ca Cancer Capricorn eclipses June 21st and July 5th, but this eclipse cycle is sort of the formal ending of a year and a half of Cancer, the nodes of the moon being in the signs of Cancer and Capricorn. So it's a really big culminating set of eclipses that we've just been through. And this is the last quarter moon, which means that the deep moment of letting go and truly starting to uh, release some of the patterns from the past that have been associated not just then with this moon cycle, not just with these eclipses, but with the series of eclipses that's come over the past year and a half. That's why it's such a big last quarter moon right now. Some people will experience it more dramatically than others. It always depends on your birth chart in some respects. But one of the things that can be said is that a last quarter moon in Libra is about um, making wise judgments. A lot of times we like to talk about the scales of Libra in terms of balance, but that's not what the scales are an image of. The scales are not an image of, of balance as much as they are an image of justice. And sometimes justice means weighing things out, um, measuring things out, doling out rewards and punishments. And this is the real meaning of the scales as they're used in, for example, the 
uh, Egyptian underworld where the heart is weighed against a feather. If the heart is heavier than the, than the feather, uh, then you know, the, the soul doesn't necessarily get its just reward. It might even get uh, some karmic uh, punishment. If the heart is lighter than a feather, um, and of course that's um, an esoteric idea, um, obviously, a heart's always going to be heavier than a feather, right? So if the heart is lighter than the feather, then, uh, then the transmigration of the soul to the, to the afterlife goes well, right? So we're weighing things. We're, this is a, the, Libra is a sign of judgment as well as measuring and counting and weighing things. Uh, and this is why it is the exaltation of Saturn and the sign that sits on the cusp of the yearly underworld, the sun sinks into the south. And uh, for six months of the year, we're in the yin phase of year where there's more darkness and there is light in the 24 hour day. So the karmic realm is implied by the sign of Libra, the realm of karmic justice, of getting results based on what we deserve. Hard work pays off in the karmic realm and uh, bad deeds are, are punished in the karmic realm, not always in the way that we think. Um, and that's not the only thing that's operating in this world too. There's also divine grace, divine intervention. Um, and, and so the gist of it in ancient astrology is that the wiser that we are living and the more conscious choices that we are making, the more we're prioritizing our spiritual path, the more that God or divinity takes over for the way in which our karma plays out. If we're not on that path, then the way that karma plays out in our chart is a little bit more of, uh, it has more to do with the letter of the law. It's more mechanical. And you could say that it's more impersonal, the way that our karma operates when we're not thinking or acting or behaving consciously in the world, and we're not on a spiritual path. Now that idea is repeated in both the East and the West in many different ways. So when we get to the exaltation of Saturn, the sign of Libra, um, and we have a last quarter moon in the burnt path, right? The moon, what is the moon? The moon represents generally the world of karma and the world of change, impermanence, constant transit, uh, transitioning states. That means that to the extent that we are, um, all of us karmic beings who have chains of causal events playing out in our lives from past lives and this life and so forth, we're reaching a really big deciding moment a crossroads where a big choice has to be made, where values have to be weighed and judgments have to be made about what we're going to do or not do. The last quarter moon implies a period of evaluation, a period of letting go of ideas who have served their purpose but are no longer serving us or of patterns, habits, behaviors whose time is up and we're either suffering some of the consequences right now um, from maybe not giving something up at the time we knew we needed to, or we might be, you know, just suffering the consequences of having to let go of something in who, whose expiration date is upon us, but it might not necessarily be easy to let go of. Um, but there, that, that's the last quarter moon in general. Every lunar cycle has a kind of letting go, uh, releasing, surrendering, um, but it's an inward period where we're, we're also, it may be very inward and we may be just starting the process of starting to let go of something. Um, as Dimitri was saying in the book, it's as though um, the, the shell of the past may still exist in some way, but it's, it's a husk now and it's, it's going to start to fall off. So, but with Libra, this can take on this feeling of karmic judgment. It's time to make the wise, karmic, mature decision. Uh, it's time in some ways with uh, squares to Saturn and Pluto emphasized, it is time to make a transformative, adult, mature decision, limiting something, committing to something, saying no to something, refining or defining our commitments in a greater way, doing the hard but necessary thing. Um, those are the kinds of circumstances that will tend to come up right now. And it's a little deeper than normal because this is, again, these are eclipses. And this may also have to do with very deep patterns from the ancestral past, from family karma, due to the fact that these eclipses have been happening across the Cancer Capricorn axis, which is a moon-Saturn dynamic. And we know that the moon-Saturn dynamic, among other things, has a lot to do with family karma, the good and the bad of it, the things that the family karma has gifted us with that maybe, you know, the, the, the karmic trust fund has run out and now we're on our own in some way. 
or um, there may be some way in which uh, there's, there's death, letting go, or surrender of things from the past, things that are in some ways regressive, childlike, or uh, nostalgic. Uh, there may also be a need to reformulate a healthier emotional set of bonds or commitments uh, that these eclipses have brought up. Um, if you look back and check out the videos that I've made on the Cancer Capricorn axis in general, you'll get, and the eclipse in cancer that I just did, a qu quick video on the eclipse in cancer, you get an even deeper take on what the nodes of the moon in these two signs might mean. But there's a very deep emotional reality to these eclipses with the moon and you know the, the, uh, the sign of cancer um, being involved in the eclipses and, and the sign of Capricorn also, the qu questions of adulthood and also questions about you know, how do we prioritize things emotionally? How do we commit and create um, a more healthy, mature way of living, of containing our energy and committing to the right things emotionally. And it's a, it's a time of judgment. Uh, the, the Libra is the, t is the sign of the autumn equinox, which is the harvest. So we're harvesting things right now and releasing things. So I want to tell you a story, two little stories that I hope may be helpful to you as you're going through this passage right now. And again, some people will experience this more or less intensely than others based on how these things are hitting your birth chart. Look to the house of Libra in your chart. See where that's, you know, where that's happening. All right. Sorry about that. I'd had a little technical difficulty. So there's two stories that I want to share with you that I think illustrate the last quarter energy. Now, right now in my own birth chart, Saturn is opposing the sun, uh, Pluto and Saturn opposing the sun in my chart in Cancer. So I've had some experiences lately that have been, you know, pretty intense, but deep personal transformational experiences, which are prone to happen when, you know, the sun or the moon is getting hard aspects from slower moving planets like Saturn or Neptune or Pluto or Uranus and so forth. So at any rate, the first story is, is simple. Um, I got invited to um, do something. Uh, I got invited to do some readings uh, at one of the backstage gifting suites at the Oscars in February and uh, I announced this on social media right after it happened. And then during this eclipse season, as it played out, uh, the Kickstarter did very well. And I came to have a lot of reward readings that I need to do for people as a result of, you know, people pitching in. And um, you can, when you pitch into my Kickstarter, you can, you can pick a reward. And so I've got a big stack of these reward recordings, little mini recordings to make for people. And... Um, also, you know, there's been things going on with my, my kids and health and so forth. And if I were to go to the Oscars, I would basically be delaying, um, my work with, um, uh, these readings that I have to do. And I would be, um, you know, leaving my wife on her own with the kids and it would, it costs a lot of money. It doesn't pay anything. And for me, the initial decision to go was just cool life experience, like, of course, I'm going to go do that. There's no guarantee who shows up to these gifting suites. They're places that the performers and guests and so forth are invited, and they basically are, are gifted with all different kinds of merchandise and free stuff. And it's uh, sometimes it's sort of a chance for people to try to get celebrity endorsements and things like that. And uh, I got invited. I did the American Music Awards in 2014, and it was really, it was kind of neat. It was a cool experience, and I thought this would be fun too. Um, and basically, you know, after this eclipse season came through, it was a time where I realized that um, it just wasn't, I, it wasn't the right prioritization of my time, energy, resources. I didn't want to leave my wife and kids. Um, I didn't want to neglect all of these people who so kindly um, supported my work. Um, you know, it was just a combination of things. And it was a really difficult decision, but it was kind of, for me, I'm not saying no judgment towards any one or anything. Like I think that work at, at the gifting suite, doing readings for people at the gifting suite is just as valuable a service as, as anything else, you know, but it was just this moment of being like, that's not the mature decision for me right now. Like, I can't, I can't go do that as much as I would love to, you know, like, um, and so at any rate, that was, that's story number one. And this, this decision was made last night as this last quarter moon is coming through. So it was the first thing I noticed it was like, wow, this, and it felt like such a relief, like, oh, that was hard to do because I'm, you know, I've been a fan of the movies since I was a 
kid, you know, and, but um, my spiritual teacher said something one time, which was that, you know, steadiness in our spiritual lives requires us to make the difficult judgments, the necessary judgments, the emotionally mature judgments um, about our time, our energy, our resources in little ways, in the little spaces. And the more we do that over a long period of time, the more that our uh, yogic um, practices and our ability to stay absorbed in spiritual life and in higher stage a state of consciousness increases. It takes making little correct prioritizations of our time, energy, commitments, etc., little spaces over a long period of time. And it's not anything that I need a pat on the back for, um, but I had announced it publicly to, you know, people on YouTube and, uh, you know, Facebook and Instagram, and oh, I'm going to go do some readings at the Oscars. And it didn't sit well with me. I just, I knew that my immediate responsibilities and the, the best choice was not to go. Um, maybe I'll have the opportunity sometime down the road. You know, maybe not. Um, but it was, for me, it was a little choice, but it felt like a kind of like a breakthrough in terms of prioritization of my time and energy. So interestingly, the thing that finally tipped me off, I'd been praying and you know how you're sort of, you pray or you meditate and it starts leading you in a direction and you're like, okay, there's a breakup coming. I don't want to do it. Or like, oh, okay, I got to leave my job or you know, so some kind of, maybe I'm thinking of overly extreme examples, but it's a difficult choice, but it's the one you know you have to make. And that's where we are right now. And, and that, 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 those cancer Capricorn, that cancer Capricorn axis can have a lot to do with it. Um, I had to make the choice. We had, my wife and I were thinking about moving, whether or not to move back to Minnesota, Minneapolis, where I grew up and uh, where my wife has family and where she was born as well. And we both together after some really, you know, difficult, it was difficult during this eclipse season. We had, we kind of came to the decision that, you know, we, we weren't going to move back to uh, Minnesota. And that was another really difficult decision that was really rude, deeply steeped in family karma for us and the questions of our origins and our past. And there's family there and I grew up there and, you know, a lot of emotional pulls and there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong. I love Minnesota and I'll always love Minnesota, but it, it felt like, I told, my, I told my wife, I said, it felt like, you know, when you're, when you're in a video game and you're, you get stuck on the same Mario Brothers level, like over and over and over again, you can't pass it. And then finally, one time you're like, I passed it. Oh my God. And then from then on, weirdly enough, you can always beat that level. You know what I mean? Or you're like, from that point forward, it gets a lot easier and you can, you can start passing that level. Uh, for both of us, realizing that we wanted to just stay put and pump the brakes on moving away from where we are right now and just staying put um, felt like the right thing. And that's a Saturn Pluto where transformation comes through negation, through sometimes staying put or holding on to something rather than rushing to the next thing or letting go of something that might feel emotionally regressive or something like that. Um, so I had to say, sort of said no to doing this gig, which would have been, you know, well, for all intents and purposes, probably would have been fun and interesting. Um, and then not moving back to Minnesota was the second thing. Um, actually, there's three. And then in, in the thing that really triggered it, though, was this. And that's that yesterday morning before I finally made the decision to withdraw, um, the, I had, there's a leak in one of the gas lines or something like that with my car. So that my car was leaking gasoline underneath. And I had to take it in and, and you know, get it fixed. And it's because, I think it's because I hit a branch in the road. Um, but at any rate, I'm not exactly sure how it happened. But so a lot of the times in the environment around us, something synchronistic, meaning they're not causally related, but they express the same core meaning will occur. And the reason that I also decided I can't go out west to this event personally on a more personal level aside from just needing to focus my time and energy here with the things in front of me was that um uh it drains me to travel like i'm a cancer i like to <laughs> like to stay home i like traveling but like traveling for astrology conferences unless i'm traveling to india and i'm going to the ashram and i'm gonna just be like in you know in spiritual space for a long time, like travel for work and even travel to visit family who I love, like just travel just really takes it out of me. And so 
it's also a matter of like, it, it was this feeling of like, I've got to conserve my energy better. And that's been a message that I've been getting over the past year through my body and my health. Some of you guys know last summer when Saturn opposed the sun in my chart, I had a kidney stone. <laughs> Couldn't be more literal than Saturn opposing your sun and getting a kidney stone. But at any rate, um, so the gas line, and I all of a sudden it occurred to me, I was like, yeah, I'm like, I'm leaking, I'm going to leak fuel. <laughs> you know, like I'm going to be a leaky vessel and be, you know, sort of draining myself of, of energy that could be better spent elsewhere. And so it was just, a, it was a, it was a hard decision, but it was the right mature decision to be like, you know what, I can't go because I'm going to leak energy. And the same thing about what fills us or drains us in general, was a big part of this eclipse where our boundaries being set to conserve a sense of safety and emotional at-homeness and, and so forth. And uh, setting boundaries uh, sometimes where, you know, things will drain you. And, and so just being aware of that and, and those, these decisions not to go to, this, uh, to the award ceremony and do readings and, and the decision not to go back to Minnesota you know, these were the big ones, but there's one more. And for me, this one's maybe the most vulnerable and it's, it's so silly, like, but here it is. So anyway, um, since I've been a little kid, I've been a sports guy. Like I've really, really liked sports and I've always felt like I've had, you know, how Carl Jung had person number one and person number two, if you know what I'm talking about, you, you know, so I feel like, you know, growing up in the church as a preacher's kid, the part of my personality that is really committed to spiritual life has been, you know, cultivated through a lifetime of, of spiritual activities. I also have always really love sports. And it's not that I think that there's anything incompatible about sports and spiritual life. You know, Mars is an archetype after all. And uh, even in, you know, even in the Bhakti scriptures, we see that, you know, Krishna liked to play sports with his friends. It's not, there's anything wrong with sports. If you know anything about the culture of sports in, you know, America in particular, even global soccer or football, international football can have problems too, but there's so much corruption and the average life of a young person in the NFL in football is very, very short, often riddled with injuries and often their people's bodies, the substances that are put into them, the injury and physical therapy cycles. Um, in some ways, the players in professional sports are, are treated, they're young men who are treated like, like meat. And um, it's an industry where, you know, a, a very few amount of people are, are getting a lot of money, even though their athletes are paid a lot. I'm not saying they're not, but it's still in comparison to the people who are benefiting they get paid relatively little. And most of them, actually the most, not the superstars, like superstars might get a lot of money, but in any sport, it's the people at the bottom who really, you know, are, are they're, they're playing on the bench. They're on the practice squad. They're not getting paid much. It's their dream. It never comes true. There's, it's, it's a, it's, there's a lot of, there's some really interesting documentaries that have been made about this stuff. Anyway, I'm rambling. Uh, the point is that, <laughs> The, my home team, Minnesota Vikings, I have such regional, such folk nostalgia for this stupid football team. <laughs> and as I've grown in spiritual life, more and more and more in my heart, I've known that the competitive juices in me are not best used or spent on overly absorbing myself in the world of professional sports. Other people may feel differently. Just for me, it's just been not healthy. It's been an unhealthy expression of my Mars, as one might say. And so um, I, I've, I've been trying to like wean myself. Like I used to play fantasy football with my friends and I took myself out of it because it was like an uh, just an unhealthy absorption of my mind and state of consciousness. And when I started studying bhakti, it was really um, amazing to me the way in which, you know, that which we are absorbed in um, will actually is, is in some ways directly related to the transmigration of the soul in the next life we take. Um, for example, in the Bhagavad Purana, there's a story of a king who is a um, very holy man, and he's sitting um, uh, by a river meditating, and he, there's a deer that's like drinking water in, the, in this little stream, and a lion roars, and it scares this pregnant deer, this deer's pregnant, so badly that the deer... Um, uh, goes into labor early and and the um 
and uh, is and then dies of of like shock. And then there's this little baby deer like sitting there helplessly. And the, so the the yogi goes into the river and grabs the deer and like starts taking care of it. And it's a compassionate thing to do, right? But as the story goes on, this thing that starts with love or starts with just a genuine, you know, kind of naive, innocent um, uh, attention and affection develops into this really intense obs obsession that he has with the deer. And he gets, he ends up getting really, really obsessed with the deer to the point where all of the love that he had for God, the universe, divinity, um, starts getting poured into this thing that he's just like completely absorbed in. And then, you know, when he dies, um, he reincarnates as a deer. But the benefit of the story is that when he incarnate, reincarnates as a deer, even though um, he's an elevated yogi and, and, you know, in a sense, in the yogic paradigm, that, that might be a step down in terms of the evolutionary scale going back into an animal body, whereas it's, it's hard to continue doing yoga in an animal body to continue evolving, so to speak. So in the story, he, as a deer, he is gifted with the memory of what had happened, that he had gotten so obsessed and attached to this deer. And he ends up going to a monastery where there's yogis practicing and just, uh, eating and living there watching the yogis practice so that when he dies he'll go back to being a yogi and that story is is like a folk it's a classic folk tale you know in the puranas and the thing that i i take from that that very sacred story is that um you know what we're absorbed in what our minds are absorbed in really matters and i can't conquer you know 38 39 years worth of being totally absorbed in this nostalgic obsession with uh you know one sports team you know what i mean from from this place that i grew up that has this kind of childhood nostalgia associated with it that's that's what it is for me so i started a few years ago by saying okay i'm going to slowly start to withdraw it would be inauthentic for me to try to cut it off all at once because you have to be very careful when you do that. It's like a diet. If you just take away food and just starve yourself, you may lose weight, but then you'll binge when you get back on. So you have to be very careful with that kind of stuff. And the, the Bhagavad Gita teaches that as well. At any rate, I just started, I said, okay, this is the first step. I'm just going to withdraw from fantasy football, which was this pastime that I had. And like probably most people who know me would not know that this is a like my wife and, and like people that are close to me, my family know that like I'm obsessed with sports a little bit, actually only football. Um, but they, they would know that like I have this thing and I'm kind of embarrassed about it because I don't like it. I don't like that it has such control over me. But at any rate, um, so gradually over time, obviously taking fantasy football was huge because the amount of stats and tracking and, and investment of your mind and your consciousness in football is huge when you play fantasy football. And then I thought, I, I, I watched the Minnesota Vikings recently lose in the playoffs. Um, who they played San Francisco. They lost to San Francisco. And the emotions that I felt, I, I just, I couldn't believe the, the range of really, to me, um, juvenile like emotions that I felt. I had a bonfire later that night by myself and I was chanting and I was, I was just, I was realizing like eventually for me to be a better dad, for me to be a better yogi, for me to be a better astrologer, a better husband, a better version of myself that I like more, I don't want this to occupy so much of my time. And I thought of that story of the king and the deer and, and so forth. And so I, I just, I said a prayer. It was, you know, it was the stupidest prayer ever, right? This is, you guys are going to laugh when you hear this. This prayer that I said prior to the game, <laughs> this is so stupid. So prior to the game, my prayer was like, all right, listen, if the Vikings, all right, God, Krishna, if the Vikings win the Super Bowl, I'll, I'll give up sports. I just want to see them win it once, just once in my lifetime. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm going to give up my attachment to professional sports. Now that's, again, no judgment against professional sports. It's just like, th that is my bucket of ice cream that I have a hard time with sometimes. So anyway, um, <laughs> so that ridiculous prayer I returned to uh, under the bonfire after the Vikings lost. <laughs> and I said, okay, listen, that's a ridiculous prayer. <laughs> 
such a ridiculous prayer. So maybe you could help me and um, just help me take the next step. Fantasy football was a step. So what's the next step? And last night it came. Last night, while I check my ESPN app, usually a couple times a day to see what the headlines are and if anything's popped up, it's like a nervous tick, just like, hmm, what are, what's on ESPN? Uh, so I, <laughs> so on ESPN, there popped up a video of a young man named Luke Keekley, who's this great, incredible linebacker for the Carolina Panthers. And uh, he's also, he's 28 years old. He's coming into a Saturn return. And it was a very emotional, but very mature announcement that he needed to retire. And the undercurrent, of course, was that this is a young man who's very talented, who could have a Hall of Fame career even, who has suffered one too many concussions, one too many blows to the head. And I started crying when I watched him because it was like this young man who is playing football is in the same dilemma that I'm in, which is that he knows that this is damaging his brain. He knows that this isn't good for his consciousness. He knows it's harming his body. He knows he can't do it anymore. He loves this thing. He's attached to it, but he knows he has to give it up. And that was the message of his video. <clears throat> you could feel it in his body language, in his emotions. And I got really emotional because he was saying exactly what I have been <laughs> basically needing to do for myself. Like, well, I need to take some more separation from this. And again, if you guys love football, no judgment. Please. I'm not at all trying to cast judgments on anyone. It just, it's just my own, it's my own bucket of ice cream that I have my own issues with. So I heard him and then I got the image. Your next step is this. And it was just simple. It was a simple instruction. You're not going to watch the games on Sundays anymore. You can just follow it over the season, like, you know, see what the scores were, follow along. And if they make it to the playoffs, you know, if they're going to play in the Super Bowl, then you can watch it. And that's like one game a year. And that'll be your next step. And I was so thankful. I was, I was with my wife last night and I was telling her about, we were staying up talking after the kids were in bed. And I was, I was telling her about how I just got this little download of like what my next step with football was. My wife almost cried because she knows what a struggle this is with me and how the kids want to spend time with me. And I'm like, no, I'm watching football Sunday, you know, and how, how much it tears me up inside because I don't like what it does to my mind and my heart and my emotions. I don't like the industry so much. I, I feel like I'm outgrowing this attachment, but it's hard to let go of because I have this deep nostalgic tie to football and hearing this young man who's been concussed over and over and over again just say, I love this, but I can't do this. I know it's not good for me anymore. I just realized, okay, I'm ready for the next step. Such a last quarter moon moment, such a moment of just saying, okay, you know what? I have to reprioritize my time and energy. There's leaking fuel, you know, and I I'm not going to live forever. I'm, I'm reaching the supposed midway point of life and I want to be a good dad and I want to be, I want to be who I say that I am, who I think that I can be, at least give it a shot. You know what I mean? Like at least try my best. And uh, I my, kept hearing my spiritual teacher in my ear saying, it's the little commitments and the little choices we make gradually over time, the, the judgments of how to use our time and energy to further our spiritual life, the little changes and commitments that we make. Um, so I might not be ready to not watch any sports, <laughs> right? But this was a huge step for me in my little world, in my little sphere of the universe. Like this was a healthy step. These are all last quarter moon moments during an eclipse cycle. Now, for me, they might be a little bit more monumental in some ways because I have the sun and moon in Cancer and Capricorn. It's different for everybody, but I hope that these stories were interesting for you um, and that they help you make that last quarter decision uh, that you need to make, the, the wise judgment that you need to make, doing the, the smart thing with your heart, with your emotions, um, doing the thing that conserves uh, doing the thing that prioritizes the right kind of commitments, letting go of things that are emotionally regressive in some ways. And you know what those are. You're the only one who really knows. So uh, it's a pleasure to share, you know, my own, sometimes I don't like to share so much about myself all the time, but I, I thought these stories might be interesting today to, to share uh, as I'm having a big transit in my own chart right now. So I hope you all have uh, a great last quarter moon and please leave your comments and stories in the comment section. I love hearing from you guys. Okay, take care, everyone. Bye.